welcome. Um, I'd like to welcome you um, on behalf of uh, Black Ink and uh, the Quarterly Essay. I uh, also like to welcome you on behalf of my place, La Trobe University, the Ideas and Society program which I convene. I'm Robert Mann. I'll give a very brief introduction to David, who, in my opinion, is the most influential Australian in the area of uh, Middle Eastern policy in the United States. Um, and it, it, I Martin Indy could be upset to hear you say that. Yeah, I still, uh, whether, he, whether he's upset or not, I still think <laughs> it's true. Um, for those who, who don't know David's background, I'll just read, and I'm going to read uh, uh, from his, the description he gives of himself in, uh, is it Kairos Associates? Mm -hmm. um, the business that he now uh, owns. He served for 25 years as a light infantry officer in the Australian Army. He then served with the US Depart uh, State Department where he was chief strategist in the Counterterrorism Bureau, senior counterinsurgency advisor to General David Petraeus in Iraq and senior advisor for counterinsurgency to Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice. Uh, he advises um, world institutions, governments, businesses, etc., and is the author of a number of books, The Accidental Guerrilla, uh, Counterinsurgency, and Out of the Mountains, The Coming Age of the Urban Guerrilla. I, it was something I didn't know, actually, I, I, you know, we Googled it in the modern age, so I Googled you, and something I hadn't known is that you, in 2006, you were the subject of a profile in The New Yorker by one of the great American journalist, uh, George Packer. George Packer, yeah. Um, and I, I might read, just to give you a sense of the um, places that David was moving in only a couple of years after arriving in Washington. This is the final, from the final paragraph of that profile in what's probably, I think, the best magazine uh, in the English-speaking world, apart from the monthly. Um, <laughs> Murray's here. Um, <laughs> Cullen, this is the end of George Packer's profile. Cullen's strategic mind, by contrast, seems remarkably febrile. I could call him at the office or at home at any hour of the night and he'd be jotting down ideas in one of his little black notebooks, ready to think out loud. Kill Cullen, Crumpton, uh, an associate, and their colleagues are desperately trying to develop a lasting new strategy that in Kill Cullen's words would be neither Republican nor Democratic. Kilcullen is now in charge of writing a new counterinsurgency manual for the civilian government. And early this month, he briefed Condoleezza Rice on his findings in Afghanistan. But his ideas have yet to penetrate the fortress that is the Bush White House. <laughs> that was just to come uh, soon after. Um, this is a, I, I, there's a heck of a lot in the quarterly essay. Um, and it's a privilege to be able to talk to someone who was so close to power um, and uh, who understands intimately the kinds of thinking but also the on-the-ground realities. And I'll begin with um, something that you say. Um, you describe the invasion of Iraq as the greatest strategic mistake made by a great power since Hitler's invasion of the Soviet Union. And I, I, rather than, I mean, I think we all know here the, the kind of what you're referring to, but what really intrigues me, because you knew these, the people, in, even you were in the presence of George W. Bush on occasion, um, what were they thinking, do you think, <laughs> that in is, 2003? That, that is the question, isn't it? I mean, um, I actually think that it goes back to 2001, and it, this is just a personal theory, um, but if you think about what happened to people in the Bush cabinet on 9-11, right? President Bush and Secretary Rice were, she was then National Security Advisor, were in Air Force One expecting to be shot down. You know, Dick Cheney was hunkered down in the basement of the White House expecting a plane to strike the building. Wolfowitz, um, Paul Wolfowitz, the Deputy Secretary of Defense, and Rumsfeld, the Secretary of Defense, carried dead bodies out of the building, right? So they were all directly affected with this fear of death on the day. Um, and two days later, two days after 9-11, they meet for the first time 
at Camp David and they're still dirty and smelling of smoke and they've just come out of this very disruptive period and somebody at that meeting says, hey, we should attack Iraq, you know, and um, someone, I think probably George Tenet, the CIA chief, says, hang on a second, you know, we, Iraqis had nothing to do with this. So they shelve it and they go on to look about Afghanistan. But I've always felt that those words spoken then under those conditions amongst that group had almost a sort of post-hypnotic effect later on. So when they got Afghanistan done, they were like, oh yeah, now we have to, to attack Iraq. And you would ask people, why are we attacking Iraq? Why are we doing this? And their eyes would like literally glaze over, like they, they didn't know the reason why, we were just going to do it. Um, and I think amongst the more reflective members of that group, so I would put Wolfowitz very much in that category, is the only one I ever heard um, express remorse for mm. the, the invasion. But also um, Condi particularly, very, you know, very thoughtful and engaged. They are still asking themselves that question, like what came over us, you know? And I would add, there are Iraqis who joined the uprising against us who are also asking the question, what came over us? Yeah. You know, so it's a sort of collective badness that struck people yeah, after I mean, 9-11. My, my favorite joke about it, I and mean, one shouldn't joke about it, but my favorite is from Richard Clark, the counterterrorism person who said the decision to invade Iraq was like a decision to invade Mexico following Pearl Harbor. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and, uh, um, but uh, I mean, I, I think people here will be interested, and you do write about this in the quarterly essay. But how did you get to Washington? Because you know, you've only you know the thing I read from George Packey, you've only been there for a couple of years at that stage. Yeah, well, but you know, things move fast in wartime, right? So you 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 sort of pick things quickly. Um, well, I, you know, I was in the Australian Army, and uh, I had been an advisor with Indonesian Special Forces and running training teams up in Indonesia in the 1990s, and um, had stumbled across this big Islamic uprising that happened in the 50s and 60s in, uh, in Indonesia. And I had been in the middle of doing a PhD about something boring, I can't even remember what it was now, some you know, Australian defence policy issue. Uh, and I went back to my PhD supervisor and said, I'd like to dump that topic and look at this Islamic uprising that happened in, in, in Indonesia called Dar al Islam. Um, and it turned out that... Uh, actually there was still a very significant group of people engaged in underground activity in Indonesia in the mid-90s when I was doing this work. And they later turned into JI, the guys who did the Bali bombing. Um, and so I had, I, fin I literally had submitted my PhD for grading six weeks before 9-11 um, without having any anticipation that you know, like people used to say to me, what are you studying Islamic insurgency for? Like, when's that ever going to happen? You know, and I was like, I don't know. You know, I, I, didn't have a, I didn't have some kind of premonition that it would be useful. But Bali bombing happens, you know, 9-11 happens, the Bali bombing happens. It's hard to remember now, but at the time there weren't a lot of people that knew anything about um, the, the particular people as a thing from the phenomenon of terrorism. Um, and so I was seconded to do some work looking after that stuff. And I wrote a critique of the war on terrorism. Uh, which I quote from slightly in the, in the essay, where I basically said, look, we're doing this all wrong. We're aggregating all these effects together and treating it like it's one set of, you know, we're making the Iranians in the same basket as, as Al-Qaeda and, you know, we need to disaggregate that and break it up. And uh, Wolfowitz actually read that paper, which was circulated in the military side, and wrote to Australia and said, can we borrow Dave, basically, to come and help out with this um, uh, strategy? And Australia was like, uh, no, well, we, we can do better than a lieutenant colonel. We'd give you a general. And they were like, no, no, we want that guy. <laughs> so there was a bit of back and forth. And eventually I went over to Washington and um, I met a bunch of people in, in CIA and, and, uh, and Special Operations Command and so on. And so I was doing that work. And one of those is this guy, Hank Crumpton, who you mentioned, yeah. who was appointed as their ambassador for counterterrorism. And he basically asked Australia to put me on loan to to him as his, his chief of strategy. And that's how I ended up there, you know. Um, and then I ended up going to Iraq and, you know, Pakistan and Afghanistan and Somalia and all these places. Um, so, so once you get into it, it's kind of hard to, to break it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I imagine Canberra would feel rather dull after that. Um, I love Canberra, but, you know, lot, there's not a lot of what I do that goes on in Canberra, you know. You know? <laughs> well, it's um, the thing, right? I, mean, you know. I want to get to Iraq. You, you, yeah. when, when did you go on the ground to Iraq? First time I went there was late 2005. Uh, and at that time, we were still, the narrative of Iraq at that time was that it had been bad, but that it was getting better. And I talk in the book about, in the, in the, um, in the essay about how um, one night I was sitting outside 
in, in Baghdad and this two helicopters passed overhead really quickly, popping flares. They dropped these really bright flares to confuse um, uh, anti-aircraft missiles. Scared the crap out of me, you know? And I was sitting there and I'm like, it just suddenly hit me, you know, we've been here for three years, we've got 160,000 troops in country and we can't move from one end of downtown Baghdad to the other without that. Like, we're losing, you know? Yeah. And that, that was my sort of big um, revelation when I was first there, that it looks, maybe it looks okay on the surface, but it's not. And it was only a week or two after that that the big Samara bombing happened yeah. that just turned it into a massive sectarian bloodbath and it all kind of steamrolled from there. And, you know, I want to um, move to maybe the most important work you did, which was in Iraq, anyhow, during the surge um, and working, you were called an advisor to General Petraeus but you say it wasn't really... Uh, I suppose that was technically my position, but he doesn't need advice on counterinsurgency. I mean, he literally wrote the book on it. So my job was advising the Could units. Could you say a bit about what you did and what the, what, the, what the situation, in your view, was at the time of the surge and, and you know, an assessment of how, how it went? Yeah, well, I mean, I think at the beginning... So at the beginning of 2006, when the Samara bombing happened, what that was was Zakawi's team deciding we're losing the war under its current terms, we need to transform it. And so they tried to turn it from being an uprising against the Americans into a Sunni Shia sectarian civil war. And they were massively effective at that, right? I mean, within a few weeks after the Samara bombing, something like 5,000 Sunni bodies turned up dead in the streets of Baghdad alone, right? Because they'd successfully provoked the Shia by blowing up the most important Shia shrine in, 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 in Iraq uh, into this retaliation against the Sunnis and it just went downhill from there and by the end of 2006 Iraqi society was basically tearing itself apart um, you know ethnic cleansing huge amount of bloodshed and I get into it in some detail in the essay um, and to his credit President Bush and I was not a fan as I think it's pretty clear if you read the essay um, President Bush realized a change had to be made and he fired Secretary Rumsfeld sidelined Vice President Cheney and basically took the reins directly into his own hands and said, we're going to win this thing and here's how we're going to do it. And he laid out a, a strategy of basically shifting the focus away from attacking the enemy and trying to leave as fast as possible to protecting the population instead and trying to stabilise. And it's been characterised as counterinsurgency, which is an OK description, but I would actually describe what we did during the surge, when I was there anyway, as more like heavy peacekeeping. What we were trying to do was basically just stop them from killing each other and create enough space that politicians could engage and try to solve the underlying issue. We were dramatically successful with the first bit, you know, stopping the violence. We got violence down by about 80% within two years. Incident numbers were down by 90%. Casualties dropped by about 85%. We were really significantly, you know, we took it from a few thousand dead civilians every week to, you know, 100 across the whole country, yeah. which is still bad, but it's nothing like it was. That bit, we did okay. Um, the political piece totally failed. And what we, what we basically did was created space for Iraqi politicians to make a deal that they had no intention of making, right? And it just never came together. And I think if we had sustained the effort a little bit longer, it may have resulted in a better outcome. But that's an imponderable now because we didn't, you know, we pulled yeah. out. Can I, there's one of the things that interested me uh, in the essay, just it's a brief passage, but um, you, you say in, in, in his public persona, George Bush was painful in this, you know, up all the time and cheery, cheerful and misleading the public about what was happening. But you saw him in private and you thought he was a much more formidable character there. Yeah, Can I was. Say something about that? Sure. I mean, I was always a bit puzzled by the president's approach. He, I think, felt that he needed to be sort of folksy and upbeat and kind of man in the street uh, whenever he was on the media. And it, frankly, I found it, not that my opinion mattered, you know, I was just a, just a technical guy, but I found it um, kind of grating, you know, like I would come out of these really dangerous environments in Iraq and he'd be there on television saying how, you know, we're, you know, we're kicking the evildoers, you know, you know. And, but then when the, when the media wasn't there, he was totally different. You know, he, he was across all the details. He knew things that, you know, you wouldn't have expected him to know about what was happening on the ground. He had a very realistic appreciation of what was and wasn't working. And he really communicated well with the Iraqis particularly about the partnership mm. and what he was trying to achieve. He was dramatically better. He's a guy who I think um, 
his public persona just didn't do justice to uh, his his actual grasp of the problem. Mm. Um, none of which is any excuse for invading the country in the first place, right? We should have never been there. Um, but I think when he finally did engage and started taking charge of it, that was one of the big things that really began to turn it around. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that's interesting in the essay, in the analysis, is that my reading is that you're, you're if anything, even more hostile to President Obama than you are to Bush. And I mean, you're, the line that comes up twice in the essay, which is, um, you can either leave early or you can leave well. And you clearly believe that the Americans left too early and badly. I do. And I, mean, and I had a question about that. I mean, it, it was George Bush that yeah, came but, to the agreement about leaving the timetable. But it, it was also, as I understood it, that Bush couldn't get an agreement, a status of forces agreement, as it was called, for the Americans not to be, not to have immunity from being charged under Iraqi law, and that that became a problem. Say a little bit about the leaving badly, both the bigger question and this more minor technical question. Yeah, I'm question. just going to pick you up on one thing, though. Now, I know you didn't mean this, but you said the Americans left. Like, we were there too, right? I mean, yeah, right. I think Aussies have this tendency to walk away and say, oh, the American invasion of Iraq. No, we, we were I there. Pro I, right? I promise it's you our, I, I don't much, do that. It's as much our fault as anyone yeah. else's. Um, perhaps more in some ways, because the Allies kind of got in the boat and then didn't try to influence in any way the strategy. And then when things got bad, just ran for the, for the hills, you know. Um, and it, I think Aussies are actually a little bit better on it than the Brits. The Brits act like they were never involved, you know, but actually that whole dodgy dossier that led us into Iraq, a lot of that was British mm. stuff, you know. But, you know, back to your question. I, th I think um, maybe, I, I hope that I don't come off as hostile to President Obama. I guess what I am is kind of disappointed because he came in with <clears throat> a real promise of fixing a lot of the things that the Bush administration had got wrong. And when he took over, you know, there was plenty of blame to go around, but, you know, almost all of it attached to the preceding administration. Uh, and with just a little bit of attention and effort, I think we could have salvaged a much better result out of um, what happened in Iraq. So, yes, I focus on the SOFA, the Status of Forces Agreement. President Bush had laid down a series of conditions with the Iraqis. So one of them was the SOFA, and that didn't, um, that wasn't achieved. But others included uh, an, an oil law to talk about distribution of oil resources amongst the provinces, uh, a thing about territorial dispute with the, with the, between the Kurds and the Arabs, uh, a lot of things on guaranteeing the, um, the status of different ethnic groups so that, to try to limit the, the conflict, and that was all in train. And with just a small amount of attention from the White House being continued after the administration changed, I think there could have been quite a different outcome. But the biggest thing was we had this very kind of insouciant attitude to violence. And you asked about the verdict on the surge. One of the worst things about the surge was people interpreted it as a victory and they thought, well, we won this thing so we can leave. But actually it wasn't that, right? We had suppressed the violence. But almost as soon as we began to withdraw, the violence started to come back. And by mid-2011, there was already pretty significant signs of a resurgent al-Qaeda, which at that time was calling itself ISI, which is now Islamic State. Um, by 2012, it was huge, you know, but we just didn't... We were locked in, unlike President Bush, who, for all of his mistakes, was willing to change course. Um, President Obama set a course early and just has never deviated from that, even in the face of... Essentially, you think, if it was possible, the US should have stayed? Yeah, I do. And I, not so much... But not so much as keeping lots of troops on the ground, but maintaining the attention, right? The, yeah. And there, there are certain messages that only the president can deliver, unfortunately, you know, to another head of government. Um, and I think, you know, Vice President Biden did a great job, but he's the vice president, you know, and other people are like, you know, we, what does the president think about that? You know, and I think so there's a, there, was a, there was a lack of diplomatic engagement and a lack of the military resources to back that up, right? I mean... Bismarck in the 19th century said that diplomacy without military might is like music without instruments, you know. So uh, diplomacy is really important, but it has to be based on something, some kind of, some kind of leverage, which we had given up significantly yeah. by the end of 2011. Now, I want to now come to what is at the core of the essay, and which I think a lot of people here would be very interested in hearing more about, and that is what's now called Islamic State, mm -hmm. but which was once al-Qaeda in Iraq, and mm. then was ISIS. And we'll, mm. we, we can maybe use the terms, uh, all the, you know, for the right, at the right time, use the right term. Sure. Um, 
your essay is very interesting on the whole genealogy of, of um, ISIS, we'll call it. Mm. Um, we, we're in a country, that's an astonishing thing for me, um, that the defence minister was recently asked on television the name of the head of the Islamic State, and he didn't know. Um, Did and we also have a prime minister who on, I think, 400 occasions has characterised IS or ISIS as a death cult without showing any even interest in its genealogy, both intellectual and political. But could you say, I, I think the most important thing that has come out of, we now can see, coming out of the invasion of Iraq is ISIS. Mm. Um, say yeah, a little bit about uh, its, uh, <clears throat> where it started and its political, sure. intellectual lineage. Yeah, and I mean, I, I haven't tracked what people have said, to be honest, here about, about that. But, um, you know, for what it's worth, I, I watched these guys evolve pretty up close and personal in 2005 to 2007. And then with the other work that we've done with NGOs and aid agencies in the region since, I've watched them, you know, evolve into ISIS. So just from, you know, one man's point of view, I, I think um, it, it really begins with Zakawi, who's a Jordanian drug dealer, converts to militant Islam in prison in the 1990s. When he gets out, he goes to Afghanistan and he sets up a training camp in Herat, Western Afghanistan. He's never associated directly with Al-Qaeda. Um, and he never really acknowledges the authority of bin Laden. He's sort of running his own show there in, in Western um, Iraq, uh, in Western Afghanistan. When we invade in 2001, he flees into Iran for a period uh, and then makes his way to Iraq. And actually, I, I quote in the essay from a CIA cable that was only declassified fully about a month ago, which is the first time it's ever been fully revealed. Um, but the Basically, he was in Baghdad or around Baghdad from about the middle of 2002, so nine months before the invasion, expecting a US invasion of Iraq and setting up cells to be ready to, um, to, to deal with it. Not associated with Al-Qaeda at the time, um, uh, and to our knowledge, not directly associated with the Ba'athists. He did later have a relationship with the Ba'ath, with Saddam Hussein's regime, but at the time, probably not. Now, we, you know, Dick Cheney and, and, and Colin Powell used his presence in Iraq to claim that Al-Qaeda was, was working with Saddam, but the evidence that we have today suggests that that was not the case. Um, so Zakawi's there, we invade. A lot of the worst atrocities the first year or two of the invasion have been painted in Western media as if they were just bumbling mistakes on the part of the occupation forces. And frankly, there were a lot of those. But in amongst those were some very carefully orchestrated incidents by Zakawi's people. One of them was the um, contractor killings uh, in um, uh, northern Iraq that led to the, uh, the, the breakdown of security in 2004. Um, another one was the killing of Sergio Vieira de Mello, who people may remember as the UN uh, coordinator in, uh, in East Timor. He was a great guy who was killed in August 2003 in a massive truck bombing that um, Zakawi orchestrated. And the, the goal was to frighten and um, separate the international community from Iraqis and put us behind blast walls and armoured vehicles to get us out of the picture. And only once he'd achieved that at the end of 2003 did he begin to g try to gin up this kind of sectarian conflict. Mm. Now, Zakawi swore allegiance to Al-Qaeda in 2004 purely as a branding exercise. Right? He never took direction from them and they had a brief relationship that seemed to be working and it all went south really quickly. Um, and the main reason was Al-Qaeda had a totally different ideology to, quote, Al-Qaeda in Iraq, Zakawi's group. <clears throat> AQ Central, guys like Bin Laden and Zakawi and Zawahiri in Pakistan were all about the so-called apostate regimes in the Middle East, the same ones that got mainly overthrown in the, um, in the Arab Spring. And their whole shtick was civilians can never overthrow these regimes. There's no way to deal with them because they're supported by the United States. So what we have to do the is attack enemy. the far enemy, right? He says, you have to cut the head off the snake, right? We have to punch past these regimes, attack America, get the Americans to do something crazy. Okay, that did work. Um, and then that's gonna result in America's support for these regimes collapsing and the Americans will back out and then we can take on these regimes directly. So that's the idea of, of Al Qaeda central. They wanna take on America. Zakawi's got a totally different theory, right? He sees Iran and the Shia as the main threat he wants to provoke a sectarian sh civil war with the Shia. He sees the Americans as being at best a distraction. 
get these guys out of the way. And what we're going to do is we're going to generate such violence against our own Sunni community that they're going to have to close ranks behind us. And we're going to become like the vanguard yeah. of, of the Sunni community. And that's going to catapult us into this like state-like um, uh, environment. And it, it's very clear when you think about the caliphate. For Al-Qaeda, central, like bin Laden, the caliphate was this kind of vague utopian ideal that worked precisely because it was vague, because it allowed all these people with different interests to say, oh yeah, we support the caliphate, and that was their sort of um, their unifying um, goal. For Zarqawi, it was an immediate real world goal to provoke that sectarian civil war, stand up an Islamic state, create the caliphate, and then expand it by yes. relatively conventional you know, military means. The other important thing to note, and I'll, I'll be brief on this, is huge Ba'athist and former Saddam Hussein regime influence within AQI from the time when Zarqawi is killed in the middle of 2006. And Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the head of the Islamic State, um, was arrested in 2004, was in Camp Bukha in southern Iraq with a whole bunch of Ba'athists, got out of prison and powered up with them and created almost this hybrid former regime Ba'athist organisation with guys that were part of al-Qaeda. And he, you know, you look at his biography and it says that he was a, a student at the Islamic University of Baghdad, which sounds like an Islamic institution. It was actually a Ba'athist state organisation. So after the 1991 Gulf War, um, Saddam kind of Islamized Iraqi society and tried to bring the regime in alignment with Sunni Islam as a way of um, cementing his control. And Baghdad is an example of, of that. So Baghdad takes over in 2010 um, after the, some other guys are killed that were running the organisation. He brings with him this cadre of Ba'athists and they basically proceed to assassinate all of his rivals within the organisation, cementing his authority. By the time bin Laden is killed in 2011, he's running this very tight ship and when the, Syrian, when the Arab Spring happens and the Syrian civil war kicks off, he takes the opportunity to send a small cadre of guys to Syria away from the targeting that we were able to put on them. Um, and we can talk about the Syrian thing separately, but he comes to a very nice understanding with Bashar al-Assad, who's looking for a jihadist enemy that he can paint as you know, himself as the yeah. lesser of two evils. But, and yeah. so he finds the safe haven in, in Syria and basically rebuilds um, AQI from the ground up, this time calling it ISIS. Yeah. So the organisation we're dealing with now goes way back, goes back before 2001, uh, but it's grown from being you know, a few guys in a camp in Afghanistan to being a guerrilla movement, to being a pseudo state, to now being, I would argue, something that looks a lot we, more we, like we'll an actual state. A yeah. state enterprise. Yeah. But um, you said, and I, I completely agree, and, and I've learned from you and I've read other things, that Al Qaeda and um, ISIS are ideologically very different and exactly mm. in the way you describe. But on the other hand, what I don't think is well enough recognised is that they come from a similar part of the political spectrum of Islamism. Yeah. Call it, um, I think the word is generally now, jihadi Salafism. Yeah. Um, do, do you agree with that? That, that, no, that I do. they are I mean, two I... interpretations of them? Because, <clears throat> you know, by calling it a death cult, as our Prime Minister does, it doesn't locate it within an intellectual, um, political uh, heritage. So, and I, I, and I, I think both um, yeah. uh, the Zakawi but also al-Baghdadi are ideologues in the deepest sense. Yeah, They're driven I mean, by an idea. With respect to the Prime Minister's comment, I think it's very true that actually they do engage in some pretty death cult-like behaviour, right? But they're not just a death cult, I think would be my qualifying comment. You know, they, they and I, I, I want to tell people that are going to read the essay that I did actually pull a couple of punches in describing just how horrible um, these guys were. So you'll read this and you'll think, geez, these guys were horrible. It was actually worse than I could even bring myself to write in the essay. Um, and, but that horrible violence that they applied to um, innocent civilians in Iraq was in no way random and it wasn't psych psychopathic, right? It was a rational political strategy to generate so much terror and fear on the part of Sunnis mm. and so much anger on the part of Shia that the only choice for the Sunni would be to stand behind Al-Qaeda, then ISIS, as a way of protecting themselves against the enraged yeah. Shia. It was a very, very conscious strategy that, that um, was, was part of that. Now, as to the Islamic nature of it, um, 
you know, the technical term would be neo Salafi jihadism, right? But you can get you can get all caught up on that. I think what I would say is that there's a there's a, a religious element, there's a military element, and then there's a sort of political analysis that goes into both the Al Qaeda and the ISIS um, ideology. The religious element, it's on the edge of mainstream, but it's not it's not heretical. I mean it's 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 without getting into great detail, it's like Hanafi, Sunni Sunni um, uh, Salafism, and there are plenty of people that believe roughly the same thing that are not in any way violent, right? So what that means is Islam is a factor, but it is not a sufficient explanation for what we're talking about now. Yeah. I've had people in the States say to me, well, this is all Islam. I mean, Islam's just a religion of, of violence. Well, you know, basic logic, you can't explain a variable effect with a constant cause, right? Islamic doctrine's been basically the same since the 13th century. We haven't seen this kind of violence in that whole time, so there's got to be something else going on which is not to downplay Islam, it's just to say that you can't explain this just from that. I think where they differ is Al-Qaeda's analysis is fight the fire enemy, drive the Americans out, create chaos, and then become the vanguard of this people's revolution against the apostates. Um, and, you know, the big problem for Al-Qaeda was the Arab Spring, where a bunch of unarmed civilians achieved more in six months than they spent 20 years achieving, you know, and that really um, undermined their credibility. ISIS is a different theory based on a similar religious interpretation, but the theory is provoke this sectarian war, consolidate people yes. behind the, the caliphate, and then expand by like aggressive territorial conquest. You yeah. know? And how important was it in the rise of, we'll still call it ISIS, that they were able to make a break into Syria when Syrian society broke down because huge, of the Arab Spring? Hugely transformative. They wouldn't be where they are today without without the ability to go into Syria. They and sent, take large parts. Yeah, well, what happened was, so initially, um, al-Baghdadi sent a small cadre of, of his most experienced fighters into, uh, into Syria, just to recover, basically. They went into eastern Syria. They didn't really fight the regime. They didn't do very much. They just spent their time building camps and, and, and recovering and, and getting back on their feet and recruiting. Um, they had a lot of advantages because they were better organised than a lot of the Syrian rebels, and people went to them who weren't very ideological, but they were just the best game in town. And they, as I said, they were helped by Assad, who was looking for a jihadist enemy that he could paint himself as the alternative to. So and what, to, to make himself... Look, look, look like the lesser of two evils, basically, right? And there, there wasn't that initially, right? When he first started saying, the enemy are all Al-Qaeda, there was a barefaced lie, right? But over time... It became true. Suddenly ISIS turned up and he's like, oh, hurrah, you know, I've got real jihadists yeah. now, you know? So he was able to work on that. And so there was a de facto truce between ISIS and the regime in, in Syria until really the middle of 2013. Yeah. So they and had that space. But then, sorry, one other thing. At the end of 2012, he sent a really important Ba'athist guy called Haji Bakr, who was a Ba'athist intelligence officer who'd organised a lot of the secret cells in Iraq, sent him to Syria mm. to turn the thing into a, more of a regular army. Yeah. And that's really the, it's Haji Bakr's impetus that gets them the capability that allows them to go back into Iraq. And we'll... we'll started that. There are two big, you know, the great breakthrough, military breakthrough, where you call it, it's now a war of movement, where mm. they, they can't be described any longer just as a, a terrorist movement or, a, or an insurgent, insurgent yeah. movement. Right. Um, the two huge questions in my mind uh, about the fact that they were able to take Mosul and, um, uh, you know, so militarily effective in Iraq, the Americans, these are the two questions. The Americans had put $25 billion, and the Australians, mainly the Americans, had put $25 billion into building up the Iraqi army, and it, it collapsed, you know, like a, a knife through melted butter. It just disintegrated. Um, second question. America has the most expensive, elaborate intelligence system in the history of humankind by a country mile, especially since 9-11. You know, where they, they collect every citizen's phone call. And they were, as you point out, Obama, but Obama, because of the American intelligence community, were clueless in 2014 regarding ISIS. Yeah. How do you explain those two things? Well, so um, just to be a little more specific, what happened in the fall of Mosul was actually the second Iraqi army division collapsed, right? The rest of the army is still relatively intact. But the problem is that the army that the, the coalition trained is not the army that was left in oh. 2014, right? So at the end of US engagement, which is 2011, so Australian engagement ended a bit earlier, um, the army was 
relatively capable. Uh, had some good infantry units, pretty good police, um, pretty decent communications, and there was a lot of um, rather technocratic, you know, military-type guys running the organisations. Uh, and I talk about this in the essay, actually. When Maliki had a free hand after the coalition left, he began to replace all those guys, and he, he took people that were loyal politically to his party and replaced these technocrats with those guys. And he also replaced a lot of the Sunni police in Sunni areas with Shia police. And he did a lot of other changes like that, which led to a rising corruption and a sort of hollowing out of the military structure to the point where a lot of the headquarters were staffed by basically time-serving, nepotistic, corrupt guys. And when the time came, they just couldn't fight and they just collapsed. And actually, the troops within the Iraqi Army 2nd Division, I had two analysts in Mosul very shortly before the collapse, um, were quite good, but they didn't have any leadership, so they fled. Um, so that's the answer to the first question is, um, the army that we trained is not the army that is there now. Um, and part of the problem now is trying to rebuild that. And I'm not actually sure it's doable after all this time. Um, so that's one question. Um, the failure of American intelligence. The, yeah, so I think you're letting the president, again, I'm not a, I'm not partisan here, but I think you're letting the president off too lightly there. So um, the CIA issued a national intelligence estimate in 2012, which has since been published, warning of the rise of ISIS. They issued another one in 2013, warning even more sharply of the fact that the, mm -hmm. the country was starting to fall apart. Um, the intelligence community did not miss the rise of ISIS. There were people in the intelligence community screaming about this for several months. Uh, so, so for 18 months before the collapse. Also, think tanks like the Institute for the Study of War, um, Center for New American Security, a few others had published papers saying, hey, this is going badly. Um, but our eye was most certainly off the ball. And it wasn't that we were not, f f that we were focusing on Afghanistan instead of Iraq, we we're focusing on other stuff entirely. And as I say in the, in the essay, I think the reason for that was the killing of Osama bin Laden because we hyped up the killing of bin Laden and we said, hey, look, we killed bin Laden, so you know, we can go back to normal now and the wars are ending. And we sort of talked ourselves into this soothing narrative that it was winding down when actually the data was telling us the opposite. So I think a lot of, intelligent, a lot of things that get described as intelligence failures in my book are actually decision-making failures where the data is there, but there's like a breakdown between the intelligence professional and the policymaker and the decision isn't just followed, just isn't followed through on, you know. And I think that was very much the case yeah. with ISIS. You know? And we get now to, I mean, it's very important in your, in conceptually for you to say that when ISIS becomes IS, the Islamic State, or, or just we'll call it Islamic State, it's no longer to be thought of as a terrorist or a counterinsurgent movement, but what you call, I think, a state-building enterprise. Right. Why is it conceptually important to see that, do you think? Well, I think... Um, it comes down to threat analysis. Um, so just to very quickly cover the state argument, and I know it's controversial, and I, I know that I've, there's been politicians who've said, you know, ISIS is neither Islamic nor a state. You know, I mean, got it. And I see the propaganda value of denying them the legitimacy that is involved. But, you know, if we think about international relations and we think about the criteria of, to be considered a state in international relations. There are many sources of, of, of ways to think about that, and it's not something that IR people agree on, and I'm not an IR person, right? But to the extent that I'm, I'm familiar with it, the sort of four classic traditional requirements come from the Montevideo Convention of 1933, uh, which say that you, or to which the US is a signatory, by the way, not, not Australia, um, which say that you have to have a, um, a territory, like a spatial territory, you have to have a permanent or fixed population that resides within that territory. You have to have a government that exercises control over that population. And that government has to be capable of entering into relations with other states. That's the words of the, of the treaty. Now, it specifically says that it doesn't have to be recognised by any other state. It's still a de facto a state if it has those four criteria. And we think about those four criteria. ISIS controls territory about the size of Israel or Lebanon in Syria and Iraq. It controls a population which, as of the fall of Ramadi, is about the size of um, Norway or Singapore, uh, which is a permanent population. It exercises a wide range of governance functions, taxation, essential services, courts, um, hospital administration, education, you know, across that territory. You might disagree with the way that they do it, 
But that's not a criteria. Otherwise, places like North Korea wouldn't be states. You know, it's, it's the effectiveness of the government, not, not whether we like its policies. The fourth one, the ability to enter into um, relations with other states, well, they have what they call a cyber caliphate. They issue communiques. They have been accused of taking donations from um, a variety of states. They sell electricity to the Syrian government. Yeah. Um, they sell oil on the international market through Turkey. And they sell antiquities, which is illegal, but they're still doing that through the international market. So I would argue that they are either there or almost there on most of those criteria. Um, they also think they're a state. They claim to be a state and they fight like a state, which is really important. Um, so I think they're, and I don't call them a state. What I say is they're a state building enterprise. They're trying to become a state. Um, and so getting to threat, that element is what I think is the most threatening thing about the Islamic State and something that we really need to be taking much more seriously than I think we are. Although I'll note that Julie Bishop seems to be thinking in that direction in terms of some of the comments that she's been making. But, you know, if you think about the threats that come out of the Islamic State, one of them is, you know, radicalisation of people in our own communities. And I don't have to tell people in Melbourne, you know, how that can happen. Um, the second one is foreign fighters, which is getting a lot of attention right now. The idea that people will go and fight in Syria and then possibly come back and attack Australia. The third is the effect of the rise of ISIS on all other terrorist groups globally, and it's had this massive reinvigorating effect. And then the fourth is, it is a state-building enterprise in the heart of the Middle East that's completely redrawing the map, tearing up the Sykes-Picot Treaty that's you know, set the borders of the modern Middle East in the 1920s. And more importantly, it's drawing in the Turks, the Russians, the Iranians, the Israelis, the Saudis into this what was a cold war between Sunni and Shia organisations that's now become a hot war between Iran on the one hand and a collection of, of, of Sunni states on the other. And, you know, Iran, Saudi, Pakistan, Israel and Russia, that's five players involved in that, are all either nuclear powers or threshold nuclear powers. So I think that the risk here is not a few terrorists coming back and mounting attacks in Australia. Only a total of 50 people have been killed in those kinds of attacks in the last six years, right? So it's not, it's, it's bad for that. If it happens to you, it's unlucky, but it's not, you know, it's not a national, national security threat. The, th the threat is not remote radicalization. Police can deal with that. The threat is, you know, a hot war that goes nuclear in the Middle East. And I think that's what the and, bit that has to have yeah, much more of our attention. And we, we have to um, make sure there's time for people to ask questions, but I've got a couple of big questions. Yeah. We come now to what really is the most controversial part of the essay which is your recommendations. Um, I mean, I'm going to quote from someone who was involved in the surge and wrote New York Times, um, General Bolger, who uh, says, if insanity is defined as doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results, I think we're there. And he's talking about the thing you propose, which is a, a more US and ally ground troops in Iraq. I'm not proposing ground troops. He may be, um, but ah. I'm not proposing additional ground troops, no. Um, but, but I'm not proposing anything, right? I'm just saying what I think ought to be done based on the, the, uh, the discussion. Well, then I've misread the essay. I thought... Well, maybe, I, maybe that's my editor's fault, where is he? <laughs> um, that was, of course, it's my fault. Um, no, I think the, uh, what I'm saying is, is, is actually a little different from that. I'm saying that um, we need to treat ISIS like a state and we need to remove the elements that make it a state, so it's control of territory, it's government, and all those, those elements that make it that threat that's creating the, um, the, uh, the conflict. And you can't do that with the operation as currently structured. And I recommend um, really two things. One is, um, actually three. One is a, a significant increase in the, in the amount of airstrikes being put in, right? And I think people need to realise that the average number of airstrikes that we're launching in Iraq and Syria today is about 10 per day. Putting that in comparison, in the invasion of um, Afghanistan in 2001, we did roughly 90 per day. In the fight in Libya in 2011, it was 45 per day. In Kosovo, which most people have probably even forgotten by now, in 1999, we were doing 250 airstrikes a day. So you could be running a much more significant air campaign that was doing significant damage to ISIS as a state, and we're actually not doing that. We're targeting individual artillery pieces and weapon systems and trying to kill individual leaders. Like, we're still thinking like it's a terrorist organisation. It's not. It's a state. There's a whole 10-square-block area in western Mosul, which is the ISIS government complex for western Iraq, that we could be removing from the map, you know, like, like we would have done in Kosovo or in the, 
in the fight in Libya. So I'm recommending an air campaign only on the same scale as roughly Kosovo or Libya. And not, not, I thought you were saying that the, the, uh, you, you can't win a, a victory over, and you want ISIS to be destroyed or I, IS to be destroyed. You can't win without um, uh, US troops. So that I'm not recommending more ground troops. What I'm recommending is a change to the way that we're using the advisors. Okay? So the advisors right now are restricted to what's called advise and assist which means they can train people and they can give them all care, no responsibility, and then when they leave the wire, they basically kiss them goodbye and there's no further support. Also, we're not putting observers on the ground to control the airstrikes, which is one of the reasons why we're not having the, the impact on the air. I think that a relatively simple change in rules of engagement, which said advise, assist, and a company, which is a, an authorised approach, where our guys would actually Americans, Brits, Australians and so on, would actually go out with their supported unit and advise them in the field, as distinct from just training them, would make a huge difference to their capability. And secondly, having what are called JTACs, Joint Terminal Air Controllers, who could actually direct the fire where it needs to go, would significantly impact on the effectiveness of their campaign. I reckon that that would probably be enough. I, there are people... To win. Uh, to, to, to remove the elements of ISIS that make it this, the basis for this regional environment. So you would reduce it to the level where the Iraqis can handle it, right? Um, the, there are people in the States that are calling for like 30,000 ground troops and 10,000. I don't support that. I oh, think that's, I think I that's just, that is, no, that, that's just trying to do the surge again, right? Which maybe that's what Dan Bolger is yeah. talking about. I mean, that, you know, we know how that worked out the first time. You know, it's not going to be any better this time. But we've got to be doing more to, because um, again, one of the points I'm making in the thing is the choice is not between us mounting more of an intervention and no intervention. The choice is either it's internationally led in accordance with international norms on about the scale of Kosovo or Libya, or the Iranians are gonna do it, right? And that's what they're doing now. And it's because the Iranians are coming in with this Shia militia who are carrying out a lot of um, atrocities on the ground that people like the Saudis and, and everybody else are spinning up and we're starting to get this, this uh, regional conflict. So it's about basically saying like the international community taking more of an umpiring role and saying, we're going to sort this out, you guys need to stand down and we need to calm down this conflict that's rapidly escalating. Um, the third thing that I'm recommending, which is not military, but is actually even more important, is we've got to start thinking about how to make peace in Syria. Because actually Syria is the driver of a lot of what we're seeing and it's the it's sort of the vacuum that's sucking a lot of these people in. So we could solve ISIS in Iraq, but if we don't deal with Syria, we still have the same problem in another year or two. And that's a peace strategy. That's not a military strategy. It's about getting people to the peace table to the point where they can see a negotiated outcome as a better solution than continuing to fight each other. And one of the reasons why that hasn't happened today is we've had disarray on the part of the international community and we haven't had the engagement on the peace process that we really need <coughs> To see. But for that to work, you'd have to also destroy IS in yeah, there needs Syria. To, to get to the point where you can have that negotiation, you need to change the military reality on the ground. Yeah. Syria, is a, we haven't really talked about it, it's a whole different kettle of fish, right? Because you've got a big um, Jabhat al-Nusra, a big al-Qaeda organisation in, um, in, in Syria, and one of the greatest achievements of IS is they've actually managed to make al-Qaeda look reasonable by comparison. Um, and you've got uh, nationalist groups and a bunch of other groups. So it's, it's a very different picture from what we see in Iraq. But it, what, one of the things I say in the essay is after we pushed bin Laden out of Afghanistan, we had this really complex problem going on in Pakistan. And instead of dealing with that, because it was too complicated to think about, we just went and invaded Iraq because it was simpler, right? Syria is to Iraq today the way that Pakistan was to Afghanistan in 2001. It's that complex problem. No one wants to look at it. It's all too hard. But actually, that's where we've got to put a lot of our intellectual effort, or you know, you could throw, you could throw a million troops into Iraq, it wouldn't make a difference unless you solve that, uh -huh. that problem. So I think we've got um, 10 minutes for questions. Um, thank you. Um, you recommended more um, use of air strikes. How do you get those observers on the ground um, to guide the strikes in a proxy foreign country, foreign state? How do you get the long-term presence of those observers in there? I don't think we're looking at long term as in years. I think it's a matter of, of months. Um, but I'll give you a good example. Up in Kurdistan, the, um, there are a number of training teams um, engaged supporting the Kurds who are fighting a fairly intense fight with um, ISIS east of Mosul. Uh, 
I won't name countries, but um, three of the four countries that are training have sent trainers in to uh, locations about 10 miles behind the lines, and they've set up training schools, and they're waiting for the Kurds to come back to, for training. And no one's turning up, because you know what? They're busy fighting ISIS on the front line. The fourth country has put its trainers right on the front line, and they are just doing training. They're not engaging in combat, but they've been highly effective because they're there. Right? Um, and uh, they're being welcomed. There's not a lot of pushback on their presence because they're actually contributing. So like they might spend the morning training these guys on you know, how to fire a mortar, and then in the afternoon, the Kurds practice it by firing on the, on the ISIS guys. So it's pretty close to, to combat, but it isn't. I mean, it's, it's just support. Um, it's more complex in the Arab part of the country because there are these very powerful Shia militias that don't want to see US presence. And actually, during the fighting in um, Tikrit, they actually um, stood down rather than continue fighting when US air power turned up. Um, but actually, there are Arab countries in the coalition that are much more acceptable to these players who have perfectly good um, JTACs. So we don't necessarily have to be putting like Aussie boys or Americans on, on the front line. Um, one other caveat that I'll just say, so you know Ramadi fell over the weekend. Aussies and Kiwis are in the training base at Taji, which is an area just north of Baghdad. That is 60 miles, this is less than 60 miles from Ramadi, right? So it's a bit of a fantasy to think that we can keep our boys safe by keeping them behind the wire. The wire is not gonna be much of a protection if this thing continues to escalate. And your choices are, you know, pull out and accept defeat or think about um, a, a closer engagement. So, like, no perfect answer. I mean, I, I don't want to give the impression that it would be easy at all. Um, I guess what I'm trying to say is, whatever we've been doing to date for the last 10 months, it ain't working, and we need to rethink that, because it, otherwise it's going to get worse before it gets better. Big question. What would a peace situation in Syria look like, do you think? Yeah, that's the, that's the, the million-dollar question, right? I think... Um, so we, just by way of background, we've, we've been working with aid groups and peace activists in Syria for about, um, since 2011. And that answer changes a lot over time. Um, but I think that it starts with the recognition that Assad is, going to, is not going to be able to reconquer the whole of the country. And I think he and, his, more importantly, his generals recognise that. It also is the recognition that the, with a Russian naval base at Tartus and very significant Iranian, Hezbollah and Russian support for Assad, the rebels are not going to be able to overthrow Assad. People have to recognise there is actually no military solution that gets them to their, their overall goal. A lot of Syrian peace activists who I've talked to, I won't name names, um, have said um, a year ago or two years ago we said the regime has to go and we wanted to see the Syrian Opposition Council or some of those other groups step up and become a, a provisional government. Now we think, and this is a conversation from a couple of months ago, now we think that actually Assad and his family need to go, but the regime needs to stay. We need to have like a transitional regime that's based on the structure of the Syrian state as it exists. The problem with that is, is Jabhat al-Nusra, right? So there's been a lot of, um, or at the Islamic Front more broadly, which is the group around Jabhat al-Nusra and some of its allies, Ara al-Sham and a few others, if you're familiar with those groups. They've made a lot of, they've gained a lot of ground in the last six weeks in northern, uh, northern uh, Syria, and that um, changes the calculus for a lot of other players. And I think that if you're going to deal, if you're gonna get people to the point where they're ready to make peace, you've got to do something about ISIS, you've got to think about what you're gonna do about Javad al-Nusra. I don't think that there's necessarily a military solution here, right? Um, but then the other players are, are the Turks and the nationalist Syrians. And one of our problems here is we have been unwilling to commit to regime change in Syria, and, and we actually caught our own bluff in 2013 over Syrian weapons of mass destruction. And so a lot of Syrians don't want to support a Western effort that's only going to either favour ISIS or it's going to favour Assad. Right? I mean, if we, bomb us, if we bomb ISIS and Assad steps into the gap, that doesn't get any, anywhere for people that are in their revolution because they want to throw, overthrow Assad. But likewise, if we, um, you know, we destroy Assad and it becomes a bunch of jihadists running the country, that doesn't work for a lot of Syrians either. So I think it's about finding that balance. Only Syrians can find that, but it has to be, we have to set the conditions militarily to, to make that possible. And I, I don't see, unfortunately, I don't see a lot of prospect that people are thinking along those lines right now. People are recreating the tunnel vision on Iraq that we had for a long time there during the occupation. I think that's dangerous when you want to think about long-term solution.
the role being played by Russia, you touched on it, but other than within Syria, are there other covert or overt roles that Russia is playing? Because we, we don't hear about it. Yeah, well, Russia is playing a huge role um, with advisors and trainers, um, money, um, political support and so on. Um, it's easy to critique the Russians and say, you know, these guys are, uh, are bad, but it's important to see it from, from their standpoint. And the big developments, I think, for the Russians were the Libya operation in 2011 and then the, um, the, the Syrian weapons of mass destruction issue in, in August of 2013. So in, in when the uprising happened against Gaddafi, there was a series of UN meetings that resulted in um, a UN Security Council resolution, which was about protecting civilians on the ground in Libya. I think people probably remember this, right? It was supposed to be a humanitarian protective operation. And the, um, the resolution specifically um, forbade the use of ground occupation forces in the engagement in, in Libya. The Russians eventually um, acceded to that uh, that vote in the Security Council, but they added a, like a, a rider to their statement which said that they were only approving it because they saw it as fundamentally humanitarian in nature, not against the regime or against anybody else, but about stabilising the situation. We start the operation and then opportunism takes hold and people see the opportunity to get rid of um, Gaddafi for good and it rapidly transitions from being humanitarian protection of people in eastern, um, in eastern Libya to being NATO air support for the rebels to overthrow Gaddafi. And the Russians are pissed about that, right? They see that as a betrayal and as a sort of bait and switch. So when the resolution comes up for discussion for Syria a couple of years later, they're like, no way, we're not talking about it. So they've actually significantly hampered efforts to come up with a robust UN resolution on ending the war in Syria, precisely because they feel like they were burned over the, the Libya uh, operation. And then the other thing with, with the Russians is what happened in August of 2013. So they've been very supportive of Assad. They've got a very clear strategy, which is, you know, we don't want to see these jihadists uh, anywhere and we will take anything as an alternative and Assad's our man. And they um, supported Assad even up to the point when his regime used uh, nerve gas in August of, of 2013 against uh, Syrian civilians. US had said that that would be a red line, you know, that if that happened, there would be the chance of military intervention. Um, but when it came to the point, they really didn't want to do that. And the Americans were looking for an out and a way to avoid that. Um, President Obama put it to Congress, which he actually doesn't have to do and hasn't done in a number of other cases, but he did it as a way of sort of putting up a roadblock to his own um, so-called red line. And President, um, uh, uh, Secretary of State Kerry made a statement uh, in Paris during a conference, somebody asked him, uh, well, was there anything that Assad could do to a avert this, um, this uh, military operation? And he said, well, he could give up all of his weapons of mass destruction, but that's not going to happen. And Sergei Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister, jumped on that as the basis for a deal and basically saved the Obama administration from its own error and put together the deal that ended the, well, that supposedly ended um, Syrian weapons of mass destruction. So the Russians came to the end of 2013 feeling like they had won, like they won one. They lost Libya, but they, went, they won the, the issue in, in, uh, in 2013 over weapons of mass destruction. And you can look at a lot of the Russian aggression in Ukraine and Crimea and the Baltic states, and if you put a timeline on that, it dates very much from that period when we called our own bluff in Syria. And I think what we essentially did was telegraphed to the Russians exactly the extent of our political will and how far we were prepared to go, and that allowed them to manoeuvre around that. Uh, I think Russia's running its own foreign policy that isn't all about the United States, but a large part of it is about seeking to re-litigate the outcome of not so much the Cold War, but what happened with the expansion of NATO after the Cold War, and to try to roll back some of what they perceive as unwarranted US influence in their near abroad. And that includes Syria, because Syria is a long-standing uh, Russian ally. We've really passed the time, but we'll have one last question and then we'll have to, unfortunately, wind up. Well, I hope it's not a too long a one. But yeah, look, it always seemed to me that um, the, the Israel-Palestine question, the continuing occupation of Palestine and, and repression of Palestinians had a lot to do with the radicalisation in the region as a whole. 
but I'd just like your comment on the relative strength of that as compared to, obviously, you know, you've already said how much the 2003 invasion of Iraq basically left this power vacuum and maybe Islamic State wouldn't even exist now if that hadn't happened. But, yeah, how would you rate the, the Palestine thing as opposed to the invasion of Iraq? Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree with you that ISIS wouldn't exist except for the invasion of Iraq. I mean, it is a, it's a creature of the invasion of Iraq, but it's also a creature of the precipitate withdrawal from Iraq. You know, it was, it was both those things, and therefore plenty of blame, you know, to go around for everybody. Um, I, I want to preface this by saying I'm not an Israel-Palestine expert. I've never done field work um, in Israel, so yeah, yeah, I only yeah. know sort of what I read, you know, um, the same as you guys. I have talked to a few Israeli diplomats um, on, on the question. Uh, and a lot of Palestinians as well. Um, but to the extent that I'm, I'm, I'm able to comment on it, I think that um, it certainly is an issue. Uh, how I would characterise it is it actually goes back to the 1978 Camp David Accords under President Carter, where the Arab regimes led by initially Egypt, Egypt made a formal peace agreement with, um, with Israel and the other Arab states made kind of de facto um, you know, peace of, of various kinds. And that was seen as fundamentally illegitimizing those regimes by people like Zawahiri and people that eventually ended up in, in Al-Qaeda because they saw that as completely, um, you know, you, you're now making a peace deal with the Zionist entity so you're no, no longer legitimate as any kind of, uh, of, of government in a Muslim uh, country. And so from that peace deal, and, you know, out of the peace deal comes... Uh, guaranteed military aid for both Egypt and Israel, right? That's part of that deal. And so we continue to pump a lot of military assistance to Israel and to Egypt because of the requirements of, of the, the Camp David Accords. And so that 78 deal is what leads to the rise of a lot of radical groups in Egypt, including Zawahiri's group, which is involved in the 1981 assassination of Ahmad Sadat, from which this is this massive regional crackdown, which actually brings to life uh, Egyptian Islamic Jihad, right? So, which is which is Zawahiri's group, which is one half of Al Qaeda when it's formed in in the 80s. The other half is Bin Laden's group, the so-called um, Arab Services Bureau, and that comes from a much more Saudi critique. And I think Bin Laden often quoted and talked about um, Palestine as a significant issue, but he quoted Chechnya and he quoted Iraq and he quoted a bunch of others as well. He was he was looking for a, a variety of grievances, and I'm not sure that Palestine was the top of his list. For bin Laden, the top of his list was what was going on in Saudi Arabia itself and the fact that he didn't see the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia as fully living up to the obligations that it had as keeper of the holy places of Islam and, and as uh, head of the Wahhabi allowing religion. American troops. Yeah, and having American troops based there after Saddam's invasion of Kuwait and so on. In fact, one of the rationales that the Americans put forward for the invasion of Iraq in 2003 was that it would allow them to remove those garrisons from Saudi Arabia, which was one of bin Laden's big grievances, which, you know, th again, it shows you the, the, the weakness of some of the thinking here, right? It's like, oh, you're unhappy because of that? All right, I'm going to smack you over here, and now oh, are you happy now? You know, <laughs> we, we, didn't, we didn't sort of think that through. But, uh, but I think, so it's definitely there. It's definitely a factor. It is certainly a motivator for some of the people involved, but I, I'm not, I don't really have the data to say whether it's like the motivator or just one of a group. My impression is it's, it's the latter. It's, it's sort of one of a group of things that are... Uh, are motivating this activity. Sadly, we have to um, end at some point, and that point has arrived. Um, I think we've been incredibly privileged to not only hear someone who um, is so attuned to what's happening in Washington, our great and powerful friend, but also who has the most astonishing um, understanding and knowledge of an almost impossibly complex region and troublesome region. We've really been privileged uh, to hear you tonight. It's a great quarterly essay. I really recommend it. And I've been asked to and will accede to the request. It's on sale tonight at the um, back of the centre. And David will be happy to sign copies. I, I really strongly recommend it. And, and, and I'd like you to, to thank David very much for his generous... <laughs>